One of the John Wung's students once gave him a book on King Ashoka. It included the translations of some of the Ashokan edicts. And after he read the book, John Fung said to me there was one sentence that stood out for him. It was the determination that King Ashoka made. That all the good he'd been doing, he didn't want to dedicate it to becoming king again. What he wanted instead was to have a capability within himself. That's a literal translation of the time. You might say he wanted to have the ability to depend on himself. You can imagine as king he had to depend on a lot of other people. And you get a sense reading the edicts that he was frustrated that nobody seemed to be quite up to what he wanted them to do. So he wanted to be in a position where he could depend on himself. That really struck a chord with John Fuang. You can understand why with the history of the forest tradition. On the one hand, the monks were dependent on the fact that there had been some reforms coming out of Bangkok, new texts coming out of Bangkok. But all the forest Johns really had to depend on themselves. Even to the extent of depending on themselves to recognize the true Dharma when it came. It's not the case that everybody who listened to John Munn was immediately taken by his teachings. I read a Dharma talk by John Cha one time when he was pointing out how John Munn and John Sao divided families. Some people liked them very much, were inspired by them, other people were not at all. But some people had that capability within themselves to recognize the true Dharma and followed it. When you think about the Buddhist teachings on being able to depend on yourself, of course it comes down to his teaching on making an island for yourself or a refuge for yourself through the practice of right mindfulness. And three qualities in right mindfulness particularly are relevant. Mindfulness itself alertness and ardency. With mindfulness you're keeping something in mind. And it requires some discernment and some discretion. What are the things that really are worth keeping in mind? The definition of the text says keeping in mind things that were said and done long ago. And that can apply to things that other people said and did, and also things that you said and did. But again, it requires a filter. What things that were said and done long ago really are worth remembering? What mistakes are worth remembering? What things you did well are worth remembering? What things are really relevant to what you're doing right now? And you want to have that ability within yourself to tell what's what. What's applicable right now and what can be put aside. Think about a John Lee's comment that if you have discernment, then all you need is a machete and you can set yourself up in life. He was referring to the different noble treasures, pointing out that of the noble treasures, discernment is most important. So mindfulness, to be really useful, does require discernment. The same with alertness. Alertness is not simply noticing what's happening in the present moment, it's noticing what you're doing and the results you're getting. And that's going to be responsible for developing skill. Take a John Lee's example of making a basket. You learn from the teacher that you've chosen as a good teacher, how you do the basic weaving. But then you've got to do the weaving yourself. Then the teacher can't make your weaving smooth, even, good-looking. Can't make the shape of your basket good-looking. You have to do that yourself. And how do you do that? You make a basket, and then you look at it. And 
that's if it's not up to snuff, then you make another one and try to figure out what you did wrong the first time. And you keep coming back, coming back. This is all based on alertness. You have to be reflective. Think of the Buddha's image to Rahula. The practice is like looking into a mirror. This is a problem with a lot of insight methods. They're not very reflective. I remember reading one saying that you have to see that all perceptions are in constant stressful and not self, except for the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not self. Those are special. Those are put aside. Those are not anything that you would want to abandon. But after all, they are perceptions. Even though they're right, there comes a point where you have to let go of right. And it requires a certain amount of alertness and reflective investigation to realize when you hold on to these things and when you have to let them go. Again, approaching the practice as a skill, like with your breath, the way you relate to the breath. Where are the best places to focus? What is the best way to breathe? What's the best way to picture the breath to yourself? These are things you do, and then you check up on the results. You're alert to what you're doing. If you're not alert to what you're doing, then you can't really gauge the results at all. You may not like the results, but you don't know what you did wrong, so you don't really know where to change. You have to see the connection between what you're doing the results. And then you're ardent to try to do it well. This too requires discernment. In fact, of the three qualities, it's the one in the canon that's related to, in its definition, the question of what's skillful and what's unskillful. The canon defines mindfulness simply as the ability to remember what was done and said long ago, which could apply to almost anything. Alertness is being alert to what you're doing. Again, you could be doing something skillful or unskillful. But ardency is where you try to get rid of what's unskillful and develop what's skillful. This is where the real discernment comes in. Then it goes back and it applies both to the mindfulness and the alertness. It's the ardency that makes you eager to figure out what are the right things to keep in mind, who are the right people to listen to. After all, even when you have a capability within yourself or depend on yourself, in the practice, you're not really independent until stream entry. So up until that point, you do have to depend on other people, their teachings, their recommendations, their example. But it's up to you to choose whose example, whose teachings you're going to follow. And so the more ardent you are in wanting to do this well, the more carefully you make your choices and the more discernment you're going to have to bring. What do you learn the discernment? From the combination of all these three qualities. As you're alert to the teachings that you're taking on, and then what they inspire you to do, and then the results of what you do. That helps sort through the mindfulness. So you have an idea of what are the good things to apply right now, what things can you put aside. So it's through these qualities acting together that you can develop that ability to depend on yourself, to have a capability within yourself. And as we look at the world, you realize there's a lot out there that you can't depend on. So the more you can depend on yourself, the more capability you build within yourself, the better. So that wherever you end up, even if you don't have a machete, you can still set yourself up. You can still look after yourself. Because you're mindful, ardent, alert, reflecting on what you're doing, trying to do it well. And 
And as you do, you find that you can depend more and more on yourself. You do become your own refuge, your own island. So you're better off than kings. Think of King Ashoka, looking back on his life as king, and thinking that was the one thing he lacked was the ability to depend on himself. Well, the Buddha and the Achans teach us precisely that, how to depend on ourselves. And it's up to us to take their lessons to heart. Take their example to heart. So we can see how far we can depend on ourselves, how far our actions can take us. The Buddha and all the Ajahn said they can take us far. But how far that's up for us to find. But when we develop these qualities within ourselves, we're more and more likely to find what they're talking about and to see how good it truly really is.